It was really bad. His roommate was studying. He was in a library. He's a really studious guy. Only came back to the room whenever he went to go back to sleep. Unlike us, who like pulling pranks at the time, never went to the library. This guy was always studying. He comes back. It was like a, a crime scene from CSI. He's like, oh! He like runs to the R. He's like, there is blood everywhere in my room. He was freaking out, and he came back, and, and uh, I was like, all right, well, that was prank number one. You know, like. Of course, that's not it. Like, you think it's done. The prank war is not done yet. So, uh, a group of people, they went on the pilgrimage for a day. And we stayed out. We're like, all right, we're going to stay back. And we're just going to have some fun. We're going to prank people's rooms. We're, so, we would do awful things. We took 50 rolls of toilet paper and put them all over this person's room, took out all their bedding, took out all their beds, put them into completely different rooms. And we saw this girl still laying in her bed. She was sleeping. She didn't go on the pilgrimage for like, this is like our opportunity. So like, like five of us, we all get around the bed, and we're like, wait, we're really quiet. So we all get up there, like, on the count of three, we're going to yell as loud as we can. One, two, three. Ah! She's like, oh, I, I've never seen, so her like butt sheets were like, well, this up and down. I was like, I didn't know body parts could do that. She was so scared. I was like, I was like, just be ready. A third prank could come. We were going to do a third prank. A third prank never came. But... I oftentimes think that's what the Lord wants to do with us sometimes. He's like, wake up, world. Wake up, teens. Wake up, youth. Because today what I'm going to talk about is how the Lord is calling us. This, this whole, the whole thing that we're here, here for is a calling to the Lord. From all eternity, the Lord knew that you would be here today. A lot of us are sleeping. We're sleeping on the job. We're sleeping for life. And the Lord's not happy. He's not complacent with that because he wants greatness from us. You know, I think a lot of us, we're, we're sitting there, and, and you know how it is. I mean, I know how it is from my own experience. You're sitting there when you sleep, and you're like, ah, this is so comfortable. I'm just going to lay here. And, you know, it's not like a Saturday morning. You, like, roll up in your, in your sheets. And they're like, I'm not getting up. And your mom's like, get up, get up. You're like, I'm not getting up. I don't have to get up. <laughs> and I just became a teacher, like, a week ago. I was a youth minister for the last two and a half years. And youth ministers have a little different life than teachers. I wake up whenever I want to. If it's 10 o'clock, I'm like, great, ready to start the day. Teacher, I'm up at 5.30 in the morning. So I was sitting there going over some computer stuff the other day. And she's like, the other teacher was like, you don't look very enthused. I was like, because I'm a, I need to nap right now. I was like, I am not used to being responsible in the morning. You know, but the, a lot of us were sleeping for the job. We just, we want to lay in our beds. Our, is, isn't it comfortable? When you're sitting there, you're like, I'm so comfortable here. I just want to lay there. And the Lord's like, wake up. You got the alarm clock and you just kept putting the snooze on it. You know, tomorrow, Lord, I'll follow you. The next day, the Lord, he just keeps beckoning us. He keeps calling us. And isn't it funny? Like some of the things that we get up for, you know, like, football, sporting events, you know, we get so riled up, we get crazy. We're hooping, we're hollering, we're screaming. Basketball games, the same. We go crazy. And then, you guys enter this sacred space called church, and this is what happens to you. <laughs> I am so bored. You're like, this, this is like the transformation. It's like, church, I can't have fun in church. We're not supposed to speak in church. Church is a place where you can't have fun, and only God wants to speak to you. There's no communion here. There's no fun. And I have to be bored because the priest is probably going to be bored. No, that's not true. The Lord wants to commune with us. He wants to have a relationship with us. This is a, the quote from Ephesians. Ephesians 5. The Lord tells us, Away, O sleeper, arise from slumber. Christ is calling your name. Christ is calling your name today. Tonight. He's calling you. Many of you guys came from all over the places, and we represent from different states, different parishes, different dioceses. But we come together tonight in support of life. We come together because God has called us here. And how will we respond to that? Our whole Christian life is a call and response. The Lord in His goodness says, I'm not going to force you to love me. I'm going to call you to it. I'm going to ask you. I'm going to invite you. But it's your choice to say, I love you back. And for many of us, we go to youth events, we go to conferences, we go to pro-life, we're like, yeah, life! 
and then we go home and we never do anything else the rest of the year. It's like an arena type of an event. We go, we cheer, all right, that was an awesome speech. All right, Sister Marilyn, that was really cool. How do you even do that with your fingers? I've never seen a nun do that before. <laughs> we get all excited. But then when the next day comes, how does our friends know that we're pro-life? How do our friends know that we're Christian? How does our life carry over? We love to segregate everything. My faith life is here. My personal life is here. And my offering is over here. I know it because I used to do it all the time. When I was in high school, I was into sports, and I had my sports friends over here, and I had my, my CCD, my faith formation people over here. And on Sundays, I would do that thing, and the rest of the week, I was over there doing that. And I said, you know what, like, faith, there's no place for faith in school. There's no place for faith in my normal life. If people ask me about it, yeah, I'll say something, but you can, you're not gonna be able to see what I believe just by me going up and talking to you. That's not who I am. And I think in this world today, Christ is calling prophets. Prophets of life, love, and joy. He's calling you. How can he call me? <coughs> St. Francis of Assisi, one of the greatest saints of all time. Maybe one of the closest saints to the heart of Christ. He said, if God can pick me, he can pick anybody. I believe that for myself as well. The, the place that I was in my life, I had to hit rock bottom before Christ says, all right. Let's start working. Because many of us, we fight it, we fight it, we fight it. And God's like, all right, when you're done fighting, I'll come, I'll come talk to you. He's right there the whole time. We just keep fighting that call. We keep fighting that call because we know, Lord, if I say yes to you, what's going to happen to my life? How am I going to be changed? How will I be different? Because it's all fun going to these events. But when I have to live that normal life of sacrifice, what does that entail? What does that entail? One of the thing, biggest things I think inhibits us from our sainthood. You're going to hear me talk about this a little bit tonight. We're called to be saints. Man, I'm not a saint. That's not what you be telling yourself right now. I'm not a saint. I'm the farthest thing from a saint. Let me tell you, Christ is calling you to be holy. Me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's calling you to be holy. Everybody here is called to be holy. What happens is our sin and our fear are the two things that inhibit us. You see... The analogy of laying in this bed, this is what happens. You're comfortable. Isn't sin comfortable? Who love? I love to sin. I do. I love it so much. You're like, that's weird. We do. If we didn't love to sin, we wouldn't do it. When I keep sinning over and over again, this is what I keep telling Christ. Christ, I love my sin more than I love you. That's what we do. We struggle with that our whole life. Saints aren't perfect. They're people who are struggling, a daily struggle, day in and day out. What do you struggle with? You don't want to get out of that comfortable bed that you're sleeping in. You don't want to get up and, and persevere and get up and start your day. You don't want to do it. You'd rather lay there because, hey, it's comfortable. My life's normal. I know what to expect. I don't know what to expect if I, if I get up, if I rise up. In fear, fear of the unknown, it cripples us. Fear cripples. You know, anytime fear comes into our souls, it comes into our hearts, always act upon it. Because fear is straight from Satan. Because what happens when fear ever enters into your soul? Like, and imagine this. Anytime you're put into any situation, you have this gut feeling, I should do something. But what happens? Fear sits in there and you cripple. You're like, you don't do anything. Fear always makes you stifle in your steps and not act. So anytime fear comes, act upon it. I have a little video I want to show you guys. How many of you guys have seen the, the TV show Hoarders? By everybody. And this show, this show I think is a great mentality, a great representation of what sin does to our life when we let it just overtake it.
the paper plates, the cups, the pizza boxes go on the floor. It's not good, but that's the truth. But they have such a reverence for the word 
Where is our reference to the word? The word wants to cut us to the heart. And if we listen to the Old Testament, the prophets, they came and they were persecuted. Nehemiah, Isaiah, Joel, all these Old Testament prophets, if you ever read them, they were persecuted. The people were like, no. They would, they would beat them. They would do all kinds of cruel things to the Testaments because they were preaching the word of God to the people. Because isn't this what happens? When you speak truth, people get offended. When you speak truth, people don't like it. This, if, if, ever, if you speak the word of God in a truest sense, people will be offended. Because Jesus offends some people. And don't take that the wrong way. Jesus loved everybody, but his message was hard to take. Some people are like, the, the message of Jesus in John 6, when he says, this is my body, this is my blood. Jesus wasn't like, this is a representation of me. Eat this grape juice and eat this bread and think of me. Jesus goes, this is my body and blood. And it says in John 6, 6, 6, and many left. Many are like, I can't take that Christ. That's too much for me to take. And how many of us today, Jesus, I can't take that church teaching. I'm not going to believe what the church says here. Or I don't like that, so I'm going to pick and choose what I like. And many walk away. But the, as the prophets of life, love, and joy were says, we have to tell us, I am rooted in the truth. Because that is the only thing that gives me true peace and happiness is when I proclaim the word of God. And people are going to persecute me. People are going to say all kinds of bad things about me. But let them. Because Jesus is my Lord, my Savior. He's going to give me the strength. He is my everything. And we have to have a relationship. We as Catholics, we come to the altar, we play church, and we don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. Do you know him intimately? Do you commune with him? Do you speak with him every day in prayer? If you're not praying every day, you don't know Jesus. Five minutes is nothing. How long do you speak to your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your parents? Your friends, you speak to them a lot longer than five minutes. Your best friends, speak to Jesus. He wants to know your heart. He wants to know it in an intimate way. Now I want to talk to you about some of the prophets of life, love, and joy. Because if we don't have witnesses, how can we know who to follow? And that's where the saints come. You're called to be saints here to emulate people who have come before us. So we're going to go through each prophet of life, prophet of love, and prophet of joy. And you can take for yourself how you can emulate them. You can you know, intermingle with different ones. The first one, one of my favorites, St. Maximilian and Colby. Anybody ever heard of Colby? Uh, one of my favorite saints. I was like, I tried to grow a beard out here like Colby. It only got to like here. I was like, how long did it take that guy to grow a beard? It's so cool. But anyway, if you don't know the story of St. Maximilian and Colby, he was in a concentration camp in Auschwitz. And I had the privilege of going there and visiting him. And you just get this feeling of, of death everywhere, of sin. You just get this, I remember it was freezing that day. I just got this, this very downtrodden feeling while I was there. And if you don't know the story of St. Maximilian Colby, how it goes, this guy escaped from the concentration camp. And when any, whenever anybody escaped from the camp, they would line up all the prisoners. They would have them stand up there for hours in line in unison. And then they would pick a group of prisoners. They would shoot them and just on the spot or they would take them to, to gas chambers or whatever to kill them. Basically to, to make a message to the rest of the people. Don't try to escape from this camp because if you do, your friends are going to pay for it. So they have them, they take a group of guys, they, they just call up randomly numbers. Whenever your number was called, it doesn't matter. You're, you're going to be the one who dies. So they pick a group of guys. Colby wasn't picked, but they picked this one guy. And he gets to goes, please don't kill me. I have a family. They need me. So Colby steps up. He gets picked me. And that in and of itself doesn't happen. If you, if you stepped out of the line of ranks, if you spoke out of, out of, out of rank, they shot you on the spot. But Colby stepped up and says, pick me. I'll be the one to take his place. I'll be a prophet of life now. So Colby stood up, took this guy's place. And what they ended up doing, they took a group of guys and they put them into a starvation bunker. That was their form of method that they were going to kill them by. They're going to starve them to death. So they put them all in a starvation bunker. And this is one of the most inhumane ways for somebody to die. They go, when they got into that bunker, the, the guard who was outside says, things were happening that I've never seen before. 
People were being transformed to us. It was a sanctuary of prayer. Because they were praying, praying hymns, singing songs, because they were having communion services. Colby was, some of them weren't Catholic, some of them were atheists. He was leading them to relationships with Christ. And one by one, by, they had no food, no water. The, guy, the men were dying off, and Colby was the last one. And he says, the, the guards would come in, and they would drag the dead bodies out. He says, the other men wouldn't move because they would be in ecstasy because of the prayer. The such deep prayer that Colby led them in, that they, they didn't even notice the guard who was there. He would drag the guys out, and didn't even notice. Colby was the last one to die. He wouldn't die, so he went in there. By lethal injection, they, they injected poison in him and killed him. We say to ourselves, what a sad way to die. You know, like he had his whole life, he was a priest for the Lord, and he dies a horrific death. But we're still talking about St. Maximilian Colby today. We're still talking about his love for Mary. We're still talking about his love for mankind. His love of life. He says, you know what? I give my life over for you because your life is precious. I'll take me instead. In this culture that we live in, you know, they were talking about, you know, protection for the unborn, but life in all of its forms, the elderly, the sick, the aged, the handicapped, all life is precious. And, and Colby had a realization of that. Do you give life with your, do you give a witness because of your life? Do you give witness to your words because your words give life or do you tear people down and bring death into the world? Because with every word you say, you'll be held accountable. Are you always tearing somebody down or are you building them up? A friend once told me, he goes, always praise publicly and criticize privately. Are you always going to gossiping, telling somebody, hey, the next new story? Or are you going to say, hey, how can I build you up? Because you need to be built up. I need to be built up. As tough as we are, we put these thick shells up, these walls. Why do we put walls up? Because we don't want to get hurt. But Christ never intended us to put walls up. He says, I want you to have free communication with one another. So Colby, he's the first saint, the prophet of life that we can look to and says, yes, that's somebody I can model my life after. Next one, prophet of life, excuse me, prophets of love, excuse me. Blessed Jose Sanchez Del Rio. He's one of my favorite almost saints. He's blessed right now. He grew up in Mexico in the early 1900s during the Mexico Revolution. And if you know anything about that time period, if you're, if you're trying to be Catholic, they shoot you. You're, you're persecuted for being Catholic. So you got the Mexican government basically persecuting Catholics. This is a big war between the two. And Jose, he had a couple brothers. They, they had this big battle. He told his mom, I, I need to go to battle. I need to fight for my faith. And his mom's like, you're not going to go fight for the faith. You're, you're only a little boy. He was, I think, 14 years old. I need to fight for my faith. I'm not going to let you do it. Finally, after his persistence, mom, I need to do it. She says, all right, you can go out to battle. And he, had, he got so much notoriety for his holiness that the general let him carry his sword out in battle. That's a picture of him. He, carried, he was right next to the general out in battle. Well, one day, as they're, as they're out in battle, the general's horse gets shot. They're out right out in the middle of the battlefield. Jose goes, take my horse. You're more important to the cause than I am. So he gets the general's horse, and he stays right in the middle of the field. And as he's in the field, he gets caught by the Mexican government. They, they pick him up, and they go, you're only a little boy. Go home. They go, all you have to say is, down with Christ the king will let you go home. That's simple. If it were me, I'd be like, down with Christ the king. I'd be like, go 10 yards away, but like, fingers were crossed. I'd be like, I would totally chicken out if I were him. I'll, but he didn't. He was 14 years old. He goes, not going to do it. Sorry. So they take him, they imprison him. They, he was with a friend. They, they take him to a couple days of captivity. They go, all right, we're, we're going to keep giving you chances. He wouldn't do it, wouldn't do it. He wrote to a letter to his father. He goes, don't be sad for me. He goes, I'm entering into the eternal kingdom now. And, they, and he says, all right, we don't want to do this. We're going to have to. They, 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 made, they took him. They were going to make him basically go to his own death march. They took a sword. They cut the bottoms of his feet off. So he's, he's walking throughout town. And the biography states that he's grimacing, crying for pain, falling down. He's got to walk through town. And he goes to the graveyard and digs his own grave. And it's still telling him, you still have time to turn around. 
you still have time to give up. All you have to say is down with Christ the King and you go home. That's it. I would be like, all right, I've suffered enough. Jesus knows. Isn't that what we always say? Jesus knows my heart. <laughs> like we always want to chicken out when he gets